Welcome to another Cow Daily. Today we are joined by Dr. Julia Grace Patterson from Every Doctor, who are doing some fantastic work exposing uh, private healthcare donations to MPs, um, and that's across all parties. Um, Jules will be joining us in about five minutes, something like that. Um, but I just thought I'd hop up as usual, say hello, see who's in the comments, that kind of thing, and um, just have a bit crack with you. But in the time on a tradition, yeah, some sitar music while we have a drink. Um, I see he's, he's a popping up in the comments now. So if you could, let us know you're a boot. I see some people are popping up. Leon's about, rocking the cow emojis. Zoe Jarrett, the E's, nice one. Bob Grady's here, E, the back at you. Carlos just popped up. Carlos, I thought you weren't, weren't around today, mate. Nice to see you pop up, though. Um, also, if you could get your questions in for Jules in the comments, and if you could do us a favour and just put a question mark on the end, it's just when I'm scrolling through them when we're live, it's just a lot easier for me to pull them up. And we'll endeavour to get as many as we can um, at the end. Um, obviously, time dependent. We'll take it from here. Roy Collins in the house. Nice to see you. Morning, my friend. Always a pleasure reading your stuff on the page, fighting the good fight as usual. Nice one. But I, Jules will pop up about three minutes and uh, just bring us straight into the stream. Um, the work that they're doing is tremendous. And I mean, obviously, people who've been here for quite a while will know that we were reporting on a lot of this stuff last year. So basically, I got in touch with Jules. I went, Jules, you fancy comparing notes? So this is us comparing notes. So looking forward to seeing what's happening. Dave Slaz, hello, Alan. I'm a first time call and I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um, for people outside the Northeast, he's referring to Alan Robson, the Flash and Blade. Um, no inspiration for any of the work that we do, but a Northeast institution I was. Slaz, is he still on the radio? I like, honestly don't know if Night Lows is still going. 362 Boom Wand, live and direct from Wales. Morning, brother, right back at you. Nice to see you. Hope that lake is doing you proud a day as usual. Ah, oh, see, I'm just trying to get hydrated. It's an absolute mission at the minute with the amount of training I'm doing. But it's just a little lush to be able to actually do training and not be utterly ill. Probably talk, probably talk about with Jules about it actually, because some of you just won't know. Jules and I did a podcast in the middle of when I had the whole long COVID virus y thing. And um, <clears throat> it, like, it never came out because with long COVID, you, you feel better. Then all of a sudden, boom, you don't. And at the time, nobody knew. So there's ones with Sleaford mods, Jackie Walker. I think they're on Patreon. Um, but there's loads absolute back catalogue of stuff and um it's just one of those things where i've just like went right for to move forward we're gonna have to move forward but it will come out these days i think that's jules popping up indeed it is i'll just take this bad music off should be coming in thinking like what's going on <laughs> right without any further ado i'm going to bring jules in jules what's happening nice to see you Hi. nice to see you lovely to catch up how are you doing definitely mate i was just telling them about um I decided to go live a bit earlier just before you came on, just to get everybody settled in in the comments. But uh, I was just saying that we actually did this once before, um, but it was in the middle of like when I had some kind of virus or whatever, I thought it was better. And then now now we know long COVID, you're better and then you're not better. And then you're better and you're not yeah. better. So firstly, apologies, it never came out. Um, but really happy that we get to chat again. Um, and I'm this really is live, sorry so. to hear that you were unwell. I just It's just been so awful for so many people, Mike. <sighs> Oh, mate, How I'm are you feeling you. at the moment? Are you, Do you know what? Now? Great. Absolutely fantastic. But it's took time and it's took a lot of false starts. And it's took, I mean, people who watch or listen to this will tell you, I've like done a bit, had months off because I just couldn't do it, done a bit. Yeah. But now I've had this kind of like consistent like uh, production. The, ironically, though, I was involved in a road traffic accident at the start of the year. So I had to take three months off, but it wasn't for the virus. So, you know, I was just unlucky. Yeah. So it's just been one of those, mate. But yeah. we'll get into all that like as part of this. How are you doing? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good, thank you. Um, <laughs> it never stops, though, does it? I mean, I think if you're doing anything in the world of kind of UK politics, campaigning, 
just feels like every day we wake up with some new dreadful thing that's happened or a story <laughs> or a policy, you know. But no, I'm, I'm good, thank you. Everything's going pretty well and every doctor is going really well. We launched our uh, whistleblower portal yesterday because right. a lot of NHS staff members are experiencing problems themselves and noticing problems affecting patient safety now because the service has been so underfunded and under-resourced and it's really difficult for staff members to speak up so we've we've built a portal for them to submit information and Mm -hmm. you know so that we can hopefully bring some of that into the public domain because I think the public are aware that there are a lot of problems but the only way we're going to be able to push politicians into changing things is if we show examples of actually what's going on now because of their decisions so but definitely it, it's good kind of miserable but but you know we're moving forward and a lot of people are um i think now becoming aware of the the impact that politicians have had on the nhs yeah i fully agree with you i mean i just want to give you like lots of praise for the work that you're doing at the moment like exposing uh private donors um to by like, private healthcare donors to politicians and um mm. i mean for me the, the NHS is close to my heart like it is for many people like it's obviously like you know it saved me life I had a spinal surgery in the past without that happening quickly I was planning to take my own life you know I was really desperate um yeah. so it's like for me doing this with you it means a bit more you know it's not just a journalism thing it's a personal thing you know so when I see yeah. the work that you guys have been doing it gives me good heart knowing that there's people out there actually really doing the fight so before we get into this, thanks so much for what you're doing, mate. I really appreciate it. That's really kind of you, Mike. I mean, I, I'm not working clinically anymore, and all I can do, I guess, is is um, thank anybody who is working in the NHS because it's an incredibly stressful place to work. It's getting more and more stressful as time goes on. Mm. And I think it's really horrifying to a lot of people because if you train as a healthcare worker in the UK, you're expectation certainly my expectation when I was training as a doctor was that you're going to work within a public healthcare system and that everybody's going to get the care they need and it's never going to be a career that's free from stress and free from challenge because healthcare is difficult and you're dealing with helping people at their most vulnerable times but the knowledge that you're creating a safety net for people is an incredibly powerful thing that you know a powerful thing to be working within And knowing that you're contributing within that sphere is incredible. And so for people who trained within that system to now have the rug pulled from beneath their feet in terms of their ability to provide what their patients need is causing such such a sense of sort of moral outrage and difficulty for a lot of the staff members. Because ultimately it's the staff members who are having to refuse people treatment when there's not enough to go around. And I think that's having a massive impact on people's mental health. Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree with you. I mean, like obviously I know people who work in the NHS as well as having been a patient in the past. And um it's grim. Absolutely grim. And also um I really object to the fact that there's no mental health support being put in place. At, like the pandemic's not over, but after the sort of, you know, the concerted block that's went on yeah. and then they've just been thrown to the four winds it's disgusting i just think Absolutely. that's no way to run a civilized country just to like expect people to just keep working and working when they're so understaffed i mean yeah, yeah the, the, uh, for me they're just like saving up like ptsd on a mass scale we need to be well, like yeah so it's go really ter- no it's really terrible i mean during the height of the pandemic we were hearing from doctors who were working in these extraordinary conditions and obviously um, their primary concern was always their patients and a lot of people were making these huge sacrifices but those things do take a toll on people yeah. and we were hearing from doctors who were having suicidal ideation having you know really scary thoughts and continuing to go to work and a lot of those doctors were forced to pay themselves privately to get the counseling or whatever it was they needed yeah. and I mean they were the fortunate ones in a way because they could afford the private counseling there's a lot of people out there who, who can't um, but every doctor did a campaign at beginning of 2021 about this about the trauma load that was being endured by nhs staff and you know took out a full page ad in the guardian etc etc and the the government were kind of pushed into providing a degree of support for a little while they set up some mental health hubs in england but it was no way enough for people it was you know there weren't enough appointments or when people did apply for the support some of them were given sort of six sessions or eight sessions of counseling or something and yeah. you know yourself Mike for something like this you need to have something open-ended where people feel that the support's going to carry them you know through the whole journey of whatever it is they need and 
that's not been the case. So many people have been let down. And I don't mean to put anyone down who is providing that support because there are some fantastic charities and organisations out there. Like there's something called the Practitioner Health Programme, which mm-hmm. supports um, NHS staff members when they are having difficulties. So what is there and the staff doing that are incredible people, but there's not enough, basically. It's, it's not enough. And if oh, you think completely. about it on systemic terms, right, if you've got the caregivers having that degree of trauma that they're absorbing, that they're not going to be able to deliver that for their patients because when humans are feeling under strain and they're not getting what they need and they don't have the capacity, your ability to care for other people is in, you know, it's impinged. You're not going to have that ability to go in and absorb whatever it is your patients need you to absorb that day. Um, so everyone's affected, aren't they? It's horrible. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's absolutely terrible, yeah. And I just think there's so much propaganda out there at the moment, like anti-NHS stuff. It's absolutely unbelievable to me that people... Are, I mean, you may have noticed it was like... I mean, I, we started reporting on things like last year. And I, when I got in touch with it, it was like, do you want to compare notes? Because uh, do you know about the stuff with Palantir and um, yeah. yeah, Global Council and Peter Mandelson and Peter Thiel? Yeah, yeah it's I mean, terrifying, isn't it? Just for people who might not know, I'm going to pull some slides up, yeah? And I'll read them out. And if you could just sort of like let us know what you know about it as well. Because um, we were speaking about this last year and people were kind of like almost like not believing what we mm. had to say. So just bear with me, mate. I'll just pull it up. Um, it's not really had enough coverage, has it? <laughs> it comes like you, co- a, you see an answer exactly. every so often. And it's like, what? Like, <laughs> and then nothing. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, what we don't have is these slides for some bloody reason. They're not there. Don't worry about it. I know this off the top of my head. Basically, Peter Thiel... Um, set up a company called Palantir, which is like data collection. Peter Thiel is like one of the founders of PayPal. PayPal, um, obviously, uh, did that with Elon Musk. So there's this whole like sort of like billionaire cadre of people who just seem to be at us for data. So Thiel employed Global Council, which is Peter Mandelson's consulting firm. Recently, they're being asked to go to China to do stuff. They've been doing things in Russia, basically trying to bring government contracts in. So Mandelson's been asked to do that on behalf of uh, Thiel last year. Fast forward to now, that's happening. So there's something called the Palantir. I can't remember what is the name of the... I can't remember remember the name of the software, but it's software. So uh, there was a letter that went out from the NHS to GPs, and they've been told to basically share information with Palantir. For you, what implications does that have for the NHS? It's the sort of subject that the public need to be informed about because Mm -hmm. there's some bits of it that you can understand why data sharing could be a good thing for people's health in the future. Um, So there's a lot of learning that can be done when you look at population health data in terms of outcomes and predicting public health measures that can be put in place to help Mm -hmm. people. And yet, I don't think this has been managed in a way where people know what's happening. And some of the um, concern from a lot of the campaigners who are working on this is that these projects are being set up by private companies and there's not enough transparency about what the data is going to get used for and who's going to have access to what. Mm. So I think quite a lot of the concern is just that we haven't been informed adequately about what data is being taken and what's going to be used for. And my feeling, I guess, is that if that could be adequately explained and if everyone could understand and agree to it, then it might not be a bad thing. But the problem is these things are getting pushed through without people being informed. Um, And you probably saw yourself, Mike, last year, there was um, a couple of campaign groups uh, uh, raised a lot of awareness about what was going on. A lot of people opted out of having NHS data shared. So there's a couple of different projects about this at the moment. It's really, really worrying. And the other thing that worries me about the private tendering of these NHS data contracts is that there's been a couple of examples recently where as the NHS gets privatised in various ways and contracts are up for grabs, private companies that are big and have a lot of resourcing are able to fill out the application forms and go through the tendering process in a a way that kind of out competes a smaller Mm -hmm. provider which might be the existing nhs service provider and i'm worried about that as time (laughs) goes on because as the 
NHS services get increasingly outsourced. We've already got thousands of NHS services in, the, in England outsourced and run by either non-profits or private companies already. But I think as these things grow legs, and this is accelerating now, individual GPs who've probably run their service for years and years, for example, are going to struggle to compete with a US healthcare private insurance company who, you know, this is an industry for them and that they are very well versed in going through these tendering contracts and winning these contracts. And there was um, an example recently, I think it was in Lancashire, where the local patients pushed back mm -hmm. and have kind of halted a private company taking over their GP surgery temporarily. But, you know, that's one example in a whole sea of examples here. And I'm worried about that. I think big industry, big companies, big tech, whatever it is, are finding ways to sweep into the NHS in sort of more significant ways now. Um, and, you know, NHS data is one example of that. And I also think, Mike, sorry, this is slightly going off at a tangent, but because our concerns about the NHS are so immediate at the moment, because, for example, people are calling an ambulance and it doesn't turn up, or the A&Es are so overrun that people are receiving life-saving treatment behind a sheet during the last winter crisis, awful stuff. It means that that's the focus of our attention. And while that's immediately important, obviously, we're losing sight of some of the other stuff that's going on. It's sort of happening just outside of our eye line because the policies are getting pushed through and we don't have enough attention to be focusing on the here and now, you know, the emergency stuff, but also the sort of NHS data or, you know, the bill that went through Parliament in 2022, breaking the NHS, you know, fragmenting it further. There's all this stuff. It's all sort of moving forward and the public isn't being informed quickly enough to kind of respond at each juncture. It's, mm -hmm. it's terrifying and it is accelerating now, I think. Yeah, I see it too. Yeah. I mean, just to, like, to your point before, like, Data collection could be a real win for the NHS in the right hands, you know, with the advent of quantum compute and artificial intelligence. If it's directed properly, it can really help patient outcomes. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. about trust. I do mm -hmm. not trust Peter Thiel, a man mm -hmm. who said that the NHS damages or harms patients. Yeah. Like, like you know, that that is crazy to me how he's been awarded a contract. But when you mm -hmm. think about Mandelson, and I know you've like run into some issues with the Labour Party and other politicians, but mainly Stella Creasy and Wes Streeton. Speaking of Mandelson, Wes Streeton's basically his little familiar now. So like we're from the spectator for audio listeners, this is Wes Streeton. We need to, we need the private sector to help reform the NHS. This all started happening from um, last September and around that time. And there seemed to be a concerted effort in the media to put mm. these kind of like chipping away we need mm. the private sector to help out. And as we covered at the time, and you'll know this yourself, mm. like there's not enough. Where, where are you going to get these staff from? Because the, quite a lot of the private sector draw staff from the NHS, like surgeons and other people. So mm -hmm. Street, do you know if Streeton's actually been questioned directly about his so-called plan for the NHS? Because I, I don't. I've seen him respond to some um, questions people have had about his you know, are you going to privatise the NHS? And mm. he's responded, no, I do, you know, no, I do not intend to privatise the NHS or words to that effect. But um, I think what the Labour Party are currently losing sight of is that if we want the future NHS to be able to care for people properly, then the work starts now in investing in the public service and paying attention to what happens in the NHS, paying staff properly, retaining the current workforce, supporting the staff and throwing the money there. That's what's needed in the long term. And I think any sort of focus on how the private sector can help the NHS is actually a bit of a red herring mm -hmm. because I think if we were being really pragmatic right now, we would probably recognise that with NHS waiting lists as long as they currently are, we've got over 7 million people in England alone waiting for treatment. If we were to throw everything we could at this situation to try and help patients as quickly as we could, we probably ne would need to utilise the private sector a little bit in the short term, just as a sort of additional measure, as one yeah. of, you know, a whole range of things. So I don't out and out think that's not needed. I think it is. But I think there's this, this myth that's coming from the Labour Party about how much capacity the private sector has to help yeah. in this situation the private sector is tiny in the uk it's growing it's growing very fast and there's lots of articles coming out from business 
magazines that are showing that the private healthcare industry are sort of swooping in and are delighted about the situation because people are so desperate that they're now turning to private healthcare. But as it currently stands, there is a tiny proportion of healthcare workers working full time in the private sector. It, I, I can't remember the exact figure, but it's less than a thousand full time doctors work in the private sector in the UK, according to some BMA research they've done in the last couple of years. And the number is growing, but it's still dwarfed by the number of doctors working in the NHS, which is something along the lines of 160,000 doctors working mm-hmm. in the NHS. It's, it's something like that. <laughs> Don't quote me on, well, it's on a podcast. But anyway, if you looked at the two numbers, they are worlds apart. And as well as that, um, there's a bigger group of doctors who do a bit of part-time work in the private sector, but they're also NHS employees. And so if the Labour Party are saying that they're going to focus on the private sector in order to save the NHS, then what they're actually doing is just poaching NHS staff, you know, and diverting them into working for a private company, which makes absolutely no sense. They could just pay the staff better and get the work done in the NHS, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, totally. I mean, it makes no sense to us. But if we look at it through the lens of the Mandelsons and the Streetons and these type of people, they're clearly wanting to privatise the NHS. I mean, I, I could, and we do back that up with evidence as we go along, and uh, which is what, one of the reasons I was really interested to see how like Stella Creasy, like, I don't know what she was thinking about on Twitter. I mean, we'll pull that tweet up in a bit. But um, if you could just sort of speak to what's happened recently, we've got... Um, you've put this out here. We sent an email yeah. last night to our mailing list, named the MPs with the strongest financial links to the private healthcare sector since the last mm-hmm. general election in 2019. Buckle up because this is shocking to us. Um, and we have this on the screen for audio people. Mm-hmm. I'll just read a few out. Um, these are um, private healthcare donors, am I right? To um, politicians. Don- yeah, it's not just donors. So there's politicians who are earning money for working for private healthcare companies or mm-hmm. from companies who have an interest in private healthcare. So it could be an investment firm, for example, that has big uh-huh. investments in private healthcare and it's donations that are being made to the politicians and it's also gifts of hospitality. So some hos- uh, some politicians are registering that they've had and a thousand pound gift of hospitality from one firm or another or whatever. And, you know, sometimes that's like a ticket for an event or things mm-hmm. like this, but it's links being forged basically with people who have an interest in the private healthcare sector. Um, so it does, it does vary, but I mean, the sums are absolutely enormous. If you, you know, they're all set out here. Um, yeah. We're really worried about it. I think a lot of members of the public are very worried because the political climate at the moment is such that people are concerned already. Many people are concerned about the intentions of politicians and um, who's benefiting from some of the policies they're pushing through. And I think we would be really naive to think that huge sums of money would be gifted to politicians without any benefit being, you know, received. You know, it's like they're these are transactions. And I think we really need to be clear about that. And a lot of people, as you probably know already, Mike, are like having a lot of negative thoughts about MPs having second jobs, third jobs, receiving donations. It's, pro- it's really problematic. Um, so we decided to highlight what was going on, essentially. So we've pulled this information from the MP Register of Interest, which is already in the public domain. Mm-hmm. Um, and... I think some people have been really shocked to see that it's not just conservative politicians who are receiving this money. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes into the sort of wider landscape, as you're saying, Mike, that there's been rhetoric coming from the leadership of the Labour Party, certainly in the last nine months or so. Um, Keir Starmer had made a pledge when he was being elected to become Labour leader, saying that he was going to remove outsourcing from within Mm -hmm. the NHS. Not all outsourcing of services is done by private companies, but some is. Um, and he, he's dropped the pledge. So he's dropped this pledge to remove outsourcing. And that's been a huge concern to a lot of people because I know of a lot of people who voted for Keir Starmer to become the Labour leader off the back of that pledge. It was enormously yes. important to him. And so when you then look at these sums of money coming to these politicians and aiding them to do their work or to benefit the causes that they choose to support, 
those links are really troubling and they're really worrisome for people. So we're not pointing the finger at any one of these politicians and sort of accusing them directly of corruption. I think there's, you know, those words are being a sort of swirling around right now, aren't they? Yeah. But I also think you've really got to think to yourself, who's this benefiting? Who is this money benefiting? Because people don't just give large sums of money. I mean, it would be lovely to think they would, wouldn't they? But there's a reason that these large sums of money are given. Yeah, always lobbying's a real problem in politics because it's um, people seem to get elected, like as they say, on the will of the people. And then when they get in, it doesn't seem to be about the will of the people anymore. Just for audio people, I'll just read a few names out. So at the top, we've got John Redwood, the Conservative. That's 699,250. Below him, Andrew Mitchell, also a Conservative, 395,000. Yvette Cooper, Labour, 295,205. Um, Wes Streeton, 193,725, also Labour. Keir Starmer, 157,500. Tom Tugendhat, another high-profile Tory, 140,000. So they're about it, aren't they? They're, they're, and as you say, they're not... That they, There's no such thing as a free lunch. We all know this. Well, there's a reason that they stopped doctors from being able to accept, you know, free holidays and all the rest of it a while back. And it's because, unfortunately, these things do build influence. You know, any link does. Personal relationships matter as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, and I think it's really problematic. Just to mention that those figures that you just read out, Mike, they're from, they're, they're cumulative. So they're since the last election. So some yeah. of these politicians are receiving annual sums of money from these donors, <sighs> etc. It's almost worse. It's it's got to end. I mean, and I think sometimes we can get drawn into these little minutiae arguments of oh, but you know, and we've had lots of emails from MPs who don't want to be on our map, right? They don't want this information shared. They find it problematic. They're attacking us about it, right? Ultimately, there's a reason that the MP Register of Interests exists. Yeah. Um. You know, and it's because it's being deemed to be information that should be in the public domain. And we're sharing that information. Yeah. We feel that any link, any transaction is is worth talking about right now at a time that our public healthcare system is collapsing. And in our view, if you follow the money, which is what we're doing, you need to look at the source of that money, where the money is coming from, rather than where that politician chooses to spend the money. Because some of the pushback we've had from politicians, not just on Twitter that we had from Stella Creasy, but we've also had a couple of politicians contact us via our inbox, you know, with, you know, basically saying they don't want to be on the map. Yeah. And their reasoning for that is that they explain to us where they then have directed those funds. So some people who receive donations, for example, might hire an extra team member for their office or they might support a project. Or indeed, in Stella Creasy's case, the money that she was given for speaking on a panel, she decided to give that funding to a charity. And she did that at source. So she didn't receive that money. It went straight to a charity. And we've been really clear and upfront about the fact we totally accept that. But you've got to ask yourself, why did that insurance company want to have a politician speaking on a panel? Mm -hmm. And you've also got to look at the wider benefits for a politician of their own ability to direct funding towards a cause of their choosing, because all of this is transactional and all of it builds influence. And so I really reject this idea that we're attacking any one of these politicians. I think we're providing a commentary about the state of our political system and the fact that money is able to come from private hands sometimes from sources who would have an interest in particular policies being pushed through and that money is being directed to politicians who are given power because money is power, you know? And so even if you decide as a politician, that you're going to hand that power to something that the public thinks is a good thing, like a charity, you've still had that power. It's been up to you. Right. And we, we're questioning that. that that's mm -hmm. the, that's the thing, I think. To, to your point, on a, on a larger level, there was a um, funder announced for Labour this week of up to five million, and he, I think he was one of the guys who started Auto Glass or some kind of something like that. It's not important. That's not even important who his name is. He's not put that in. Um, he didn't put that in when, say, for example, Jeremy Corbyn was the leader of the Labour Party because he doesn't support mm. his worldview. 
but he mm. seems to support the worldview of Keir Starmer's Labour Party. Mm. So that's why we're seeing all this money coming in. He's not doing that for no reason. You know, yeah. like that, and that's on a on a huge level. So it's yeah. I would suggest that you know what Keir Starmer's broken all these pledges. If he'd stuck to these pledges, no five million. But he needed to put these pledges in because, as you said, members of the Labour Party voted for him on that platform and thought it was continuity Corbyn in a suit. So it was going to save yeah. the NHS. He's lied about that, and now they're taking money. So it seems to me on false pretenses. So it's kind of like, you know, well, it doesn't seem to me. He's broken those pledges, yeah. so it's, that's a matter of a record, you know? Sorry, you go ahead, man. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, and I think with all of these things, it's just worth scrutinising what's going on and, and asking questions of ourselves mm. and of politicians, right? Because, okay, so... Um, so, so some politicians would think it's all right to receive a donation or um, earnings from a private healthcare insurance company um, to fund their office. But a line's got to be drawn somewhere. And so I think it's worth us asking the question, all right, and so if you were approached by an oil company, would that be an okay thing for you to receive a donation for to aid you to re recruit a new staff member? What if it was a firm that we knew had sweatshops or had other practices which didn't support human rights? Would you take that donation because you were able to support a local charity? Would it be worth it? Would that support your constituents? You know, and I, I think those questions are worth asking because in our view, and this is as a campaigning organization who are fighting for the future of the NHS, we believe that no individual and no company who have an interest in the pursuit of private healthcare and profiting from healthcare should be funding our politicians. That's our yeah. view. And obviously, politicians are free to disagree with us because that's democracy. But we're not attacking them. We're sharing facts and we're asking questions. And in my view, any pushback from a politician who doesn't want to have that conversation, that's problematic. Because if yeah. you choose to go on social media, if you choose to utilize that platform and speak to people and promote the things that you think are worthwhile talking about, you should be open to having other conversations as well and answering questions. Because in my view, as a public servant, that's your job. So that's my, <laughs> that's my opinion on it. I think we've got to talk about it, right? Mm -hmm, and it also, the, the other thing is, right, if we had a roundabout conversation about all of this and then the public view was, do you know what? I think that's all right. Then we've still had the conversation you know, I think it's okay to have conversations and ask questions. And it's yeah. when you stop asking politicians questions, that's when the problems arise. Fully agree with you. Just for audio people, I'm just going to like um, read out the tweet from Stella Creasy. It's still on a um, Twitter page, at Stella Creasy, if you want to see it. Um, the statement that you guys put out, the Every Doctor team was alerted to a tweet by Stella Creasy MP this morning, expressed no unhappiness at being included on our map, which details MPs links to private health care. Creasy has quote tweeted this with this is unhinged no I am not in the pay of a private healthcare company because they make made donations direct to my local night shelter uh, when asked in lieu of speaking for neither are Bonnie Greer, Torsten Bell or Arlo Brady who also spoke learn the difference before mud slinging for me personally as a member of the public seeing an elected representative of us as the public going on like that and and just coming at you guys with that energy publicly smells it, and I'm speaking as not as a journalist or anything like that, as an NHS patient. That stinks. It stinks in terms of um, like how they're actually talking to you on a human level, but it also stinks in terms of like, um, in my experience with people, if they if they go on like that, they're generally feeling a bit guilty. I mean, you know. That's not just in a professional, that's just as human beings. I'm 46 years old. I have observed people in those times. And um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's me saying, and I'm not putting words in your mouth for clarity. I fully own those words. Come at me if there's a problem. Don't go at, at Jules. Because I just can't, cannot stand what I'm saying as an NHS patient. I can't stand it. Not just as that, but as somebody who's got elderly parents. They, they didn't work all of their lives, right? And then not rich people, the working class people, they need the NHS, right? They've yeah. worked and, you know, like that, you know, they didn't, they, they've worked in physical jobs, so they, they need care, you know? And mm -hmm. I'm worried what's going to happen next. They've already paid for the care. 
They don't, mm-hmm. they don't need to be paying anything. Or I mean, Streeton's saying it'll be free at the point of service. But, you know, politicians were saying th- a lot of things. And you know, we can't trust these people. It's been proven time and again that they lie. I mean, Starmer's oh, 10 yeah. pledges is just one. And then if Mandelson is Starmer's special advisor, which he is, and mm-hmm. he's linked with Palantir and Peter Thiel, as an NHS patient, I have deep concerns on mm-hmm. that world level about what is going to come next mm-hmm. in terms of US private health care. Mm-hmm. I know um, just a bit of more background when Trump was still elected and you could get elected again. They were talking about this post-Brexit trade deal. Corbyn had come out um, previous to that and he'd shown this, which was the dossier. All the media went on about was Russia and, and obfuscated the entire thing. Bringing it back to um, now we've got a completely different set of people who seem to be linked to these people. So if we've got a Trump funder in Peter Thiel and Trump maybe can get in and Trump um, said out the corner of one mouth, oh, yeah, can't wait to come in and like get health care in. And, he, mm-hmm. and then he was, wasn't meant to say that. I remember that distinctly. We've got a problem mm-hmm. on our hands and we need to actually diagnose the problem as we are and do something think, about it yeah. based on that. We've, we've really got to, I think, as a public, wake up to the fact that the NHS is an incredibly valuable asset. And we see its value in terms of caring for people and providing this safety net for every person, which is an extraordinary thing to exist in any society. It was the first of its kind. Um, and it's also an extraordinary, valuable asset to people who want to make money. And they're looking to do that and they're succeeding in doing that in various ways. If you think about it from the perspective of a private company who works in healthcare, working within the NHS, being able to benefit from a steady stream of public income, which is guaranteed and can create profit for shareholders is an extraordinary opportunity. And they're taking that opportunity. You know, they're coming in and they're taking public funds to run services. And there are examples of them running services into the ground. Um, And when things go wrong, those companies can extricate themselves from the NHS. They don't have to stick around. You know, there's, there's examples of companies who have signed these contracts to deliver care for NHS patients. The bureaucracy and the admin involved in them starting these services is enormous. And that's a cost that is absorbed by the taxpayer and by the patients and by the staff. And then when things don't work out, sometimes these companies just walk away because they, their bottom line, their end goal, their North Star, whatever you want to say in kind of business speak, is to create profit for their shareholders. Yeah. And that's not the end goal or the mission statement or whatever of the NHS. The NHS in terms of its constitution, exists to care for every person, provide comprehensive equal care at the point of use. And so those two things, those two goals, do not overlap, you know, creating the profit for the shareholders and creating the best care possible are not always two things which which align. Mm-hmm. And for, for the private companies, they're going to put the profit first, right? And so who loses out? Well, the patients lose out. We just have and to look think, at the American yeah. model because that's Absolutely. what they're trying to bring in. Let's be honest. You yeah. know? Well, I mean, one U.S. healthcare insurance company has now bought up a great number of NHS GP surgeries. And there's already been a BBC Panorama documentary about problems that are arising because they're changing the staffing models. Because, And this is another sort of related but separate problem. The staffing bill for the NHS is very, very high because we recruit and um and employ some extremely experienced professionals that's why the nhs for a number of years was the best healthcare system in the world yeah but now if you think about it if you think about how a private company would want to run a healthcare system they want to bring the staffing bill down and so we have fewer and fewer of the highly skilled trained professionals and a a much larger workforce of, of less experienced staff members who are paid less and it's not good for patients um 
it's happening in various ways. And that's the move that's happening. I don't know if you know about this, Mike, but there's this apprenticeship scheme that's currently starting in September is absolutely ludicrous, where they're bringing in, apparently, thousands of school leavers into the NHS to train as doctors and nurses to fill gaps in inverted commas. And on the face of it, you think, oh, what an extraordinary thing. We're widening mm. access to people coming into the healthcare profession. That absolutely needs to happen. It's been far too, you know, squeezed and we're only getting people from um, particular social backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is there's been no real plan about how we're going to train people, train these school leaders to do those jobs. We're missing 124,000 NHS staff members in England. How on earth are we going to skill up this new workforce none of the policies make any sense actually in terms of long-term planning at the moment yeah but they, well, they absolutely don't and it's i think that's what it is it's uh, when i talk about like diagnosing the problem we need to look at these like glo- like world lakes i don't like mm. using global because people think you say globalist and that has its connotation so i'm trying to retrain myself not to because i've been at this game for 20 odd years and it used to be fine so but it's not yeah. nice. so i will change um what, what i do want to talk to you about is um your book um i just mm. i actually didn't know when I, I asked you to come on that you'd, you'd written one i just saw today actually um critical Aww. why the nhs is being betrayed and how we can fight for it uh, by dr julia grace patterson what's yeah. what's the the focus of it and can you just tell us a little bit more about it because i need a copy yeah. i need to read this oh i can send you a copy Please do. <laughs> um it's coming out two weeks today great i've been campaigning for the nhs for about eight years now and it is such a big topic and difficult to understand and honestly mike i mean i started when i first started campaigning for the nhs i was really advocating for staff members and their working conditions when i was working in the nhs and then um the impact on patients, because the two are completely interlinked. You can't think about one without the other. And over a number of years, I actually came to understand what was going on with privatisation, how the system's architecture was being dismantled intentionally and everything that was going on. And it's a complicated topic, which isn't explained properly by the media. And so a lot of people have an awareness that things are going wrong and that things need to change. But actually understanding why they're going wrong and how they need to change is really difficult for people. It's not explained to them properly in a clear way, which is simple. And so I was approached by HarperCollins and asked if I wanted to write this book. Um, And it came at a really busy time for us because every doctor's got a lot of projects on. And we've been running this big project about privatisation for a while now. And I had a really short deadline to write this book because Harper wanted it to come out before the NHS's 75th anniversary this summer. So I was wow. given three months. <laughs> wow. And I've got two young kids. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. And remember. my husband's yeah. an ICU consultant. So the whole thing was like, oh, can I do this? Like, and I had a few mornings. I used to, you know, for that three month period, I was sitting at my desk at 5 a.m. every morning. Because the only way I could write this book was to do it outside of my working hours. Yeah. I was waking up, and it was really dark sitting at my desk. And for a few mornings, I sat down. First First of all, I read like really, really fast history of the NHS. Um, when I was at medical school, I did an, an interclated BSc year for one year doing a history of medicine degree to learn about the sort of social background of the NHS. And so I th- the first thing I was thinking when I was going to write this book is like, well, why does the NHS exist? Where are we going to start from explaining this? And what I came to the realisation after a week or two of wondering how to explain what was going on to people was... It's actually very simple. It's not made to sound simple in the media. It's dressed up in business speak and all kinds of gobbledygook that people can't understand. And the NHS has all these quangos and there's huge sums of money involved and there's different names given to all the organisations. So it's difficult to get your head around it, right? But actually what everybody needs to get their head around, I think, is that there was a service that was constructed 75 years ago in the wake of the Second World War. And it was constructed because people in our society decided that they had had enough and they wanted to provide care for every single person in our society, regardless of their background, regardless of their ability to pay for that treatment, because there was a recognition coming out of the war that we were only going to build a a good, progressive, fair, equal, caring society if every person could be cared for. And that is the basis of the NHS. And over the last four decades, what has happened is politicians have pushed through reform after reform that have broken the architecture of the system up and have introduced privatisation in various ways. 
kind of corporatized a system that used to be a fully publicly owned, publicly run service where people would just be treated at their local GP surgery or their local hospital and they knew what they were going to get. And they knew the staff members. And what happened is that after these reforms were put in place one by one from the 1980s onwards, this particular government since 2010 onwards has starved the service of the funding it needs. And so it has revealed all of the systemic cracks that had been created by all of those reforms. And now the service is collapsing as a result of all of that. Yeah. And what the public needs to understand is that the government are failing the NHS constitution. They're not given carte blanche when they take on the running of the NHS. When we have leaders elected to run the NHS, there is a strict constitution they are meant to be following. And that constitution has huge public support and has done consistently for the last 75 years. People believe in there being an equal, comprehensive service that's free to everybody at the point of use, right? And politicians have created a system now, like, I mean, what's happened last winter with people dying before ambulances arrived, up to 500 people died this winter per week because they couldn't access the urgent health care they needed. Wow, I didn't the... know that. Can I just yep. pause there? 500 yep. people a week? Yeah. And now yep. I, I look into could... this stuff yep. and I'm like, what the hell, man? Like, what the hell is yeah, going the... on here? That, those are people's like family members, man. Yeah. Um, That's... People, <sighs> people calling ambulances because they had a heart attack or a stroke or they had a bad fall. We heard from people within our own network. We run a big network of doctors. Heard from GPs who were saying that elderly patients were turning up at the surgery three days after a terrible fall with a broken hip and they'd called an ambulance and they lived on their own and no ambulance ever came. And so several days later, very, very unwell, they're turning up at the GP surgery, not sure what to do. Or we were hearing about patients who had you know, um, parents of babies with sepsis in hospitals who were choosing voluntarily to discharge their baby from the care of the NHS hospital because, because it was so bad, because it was so overcrowded and because the medication wasn't being delivered on time because the staff couldn't cope. We heard of stories this winter, Mike, where elderly people who've had a stroke are sitting on a chair in an A&E department for more than 24 hours without any active treatment because the staff can't get to the person there's no bed for them to sit in or there's a hospital bed pushed up against an emergency exit or there's a bay of six patients with a seventh patient in the middle in a bed so no one has a curtain around them and imagine you know being being really really unwell and having no privacy when you're potentially dying you know it's inhumane and it was a humanitarian crisis this winter and the same will happen this winter and the wow. same will happen the winter after. You know, this is the situation we're at now in. The NHS is collapsing. And people need to understand that the reason it is collapsing is because po politicians are willfully, they, they've willfully changed the structure legally so it doesn't function properly. And now they've pulled the funding down to the point that we cannot care for people properly. And so we're failing the NHS constitution. And so, sorry, that was a very long-winded way of explaining that the book sets out the fact that there is now a widening chasm between the constitution, which is what we are supposed to be providing for people in this country, and what is actually being provided by politicians. And so the, the function of the book is essentially to propose the question to politicians. We either now need to hold a public referendum Mm -hmm. where you ask the public if they would like to continue with the constitution as it currently stands with a free, equal to access service, comprehensive care for all, you know, or you radically change things and you radically invest in this service so that you can fulfill those principles. Because at the moment they're getting away with it, Mike, they're getting away with not fulfilling the constitution. And, and you're right. It's bad because political leaders often get elected you know, based on promises they make to the NHS and then they don't fulfill those promises. Mm. And who loses out? Who actually dies because of those political decisions? Well, it's patients. It's everyday normal people who pay their taxes and who trust politicians who say that they're going to help them. And I think it's really, really wrong. I'm sorry, that was a real, <laughs> was a real rant. But I get incredibly upset about this. When, when I was recording the audio book, I actually mm -hmm. started crying when I was reading out the last chapter. In fact, I feel like I'm going to cry now. I don't blame it's you, mate. absolutely devastating. Yeah. You know, because the people who aren't being heard 
the people who are being most affected by this, Mike, are the most vulnerable people in our society. Mm-hmm. The people who are elderly or the people who are disabled or the people who have severe mental health problems. And you don't see their stories in the papers. You don't hear their voices. But they're the people now who won't access what they need. And if we're not careful, if we don't stop politicians in their tracks and demand what we need, then we're going to end up in a system like they have in the US where people who, you know, don't have as much money have a terrible, you know, have some people have terrible lives because they can't access what they need. Can I give you an example? And I mean, I don't like, mean to speak about myself, but like you're setting me off as well. And I want to try and jump in just to like give you a break, you know. Um, I um, well, I spoke about before. I didn't give the sort of background. Like I used to do ultra marathons and things like that done my spine in a lot of stuff happened in my life at the same time that I couldn't actually go out and train which was one of the things that was helping us with it so I was basically stuck in bed um three discs done and um if I at the time which was a few years ago it was 2017 and I was lucky that I got a referral to uh, a surgeon I mean I told them I says look my mental health is shot here I'm I've got suicidal ideation you know and that I think that's what brought it on. If that hadn't happened, and I got probably not going to happen now, I'd have just killed myself. I'd have just done it. I just couldn't take it anymore. The pain it, it went on for so long, and, and as like I say, you... it was on top of work, like other personal problems it... too. It was... Because people have complicated lives and they have lots going on, and and people have a lot of stress that they don't always, you know, it's not always visible when people are struggling. And Mike, it's absolutely terrible that you went through that. But you're also an articulate person and you found it within yourself somehow to to explain that, which I'm sure was really hard. It was very hard, yeah. And there are people who who aren't able to explain those things, you know. I mean, my background, I don't work clinically anymore. I campaign for the NHS full time, but I used to work as a psychiatry doctor and I worked in London for most of my career. And a lot of the patients that I was caring for, Mike, if there wasn't a public healthcare system which was functioning, a lot of my patients wouldn't have had care. You know, there were people who had severe and enduring mental health problems, which had affected their lives in really severe ways. And often it had impacted on their personal relationships and their support networks. Often people were struggling to um, get work or to hold on to jobs. And I think the NHS is something really special because it cuts across our society and it, gives everyone a chance in ways that in lots of other ways our society doesn't give other people you know it doesn't give everyone a chance yeah but the nhs does give everyone a chance and so i don't think i'm in the minority in thinking that we should be protecting that you know it's a really special thing and it particularly well, yeah. aggravates me when we have politicians who say that they're left wing say that they're progressive and they're not protecting it you know it's one thing do you know it's one thing for right wing conservative mps to, to not protect it because some of them at least are upfront about the fact they're not going to protect it Mike you know at least they're honest and they say I believe in a free market economy and I don't believe in the NHS then at least you can have a conversation about exactly. it yeah exactly you know what you're dealing with then don't you but that's the problem and I think that's the thing with the Labour Party where they're just trying to like be all things to all people well under the surface there's all kinds going on and I'm yeah. I for one I'm not gonna just let them get away with it and I'm it gives me a lot of hope and heart to know that there's people like you doing what you're doing and I just want you to say before we go separate ways I respect you I respect everything that you're doing and I think it's important that we all encourage each other because I don't know as British people tend to do, not do that and I'm trying to break through that you got a lot yeah. of hassle for, for your work, but you're telling the truth and truth tellers get hassle, but ultimately history will prove you right. I think the thing that really gives me a lot of heart, Mike, and a lot of hope is the fact that more and more people are kind of getting over that barrier that we all have about kind of, should I stay quiet? We all do it, don't we? I mean, yeah. no one likes to make a scene. No one wants to upset anyone. I struggled with it for years, quite honestly, but I think, you've got to hit that point, haven't you, where you think, I'm not comfortable with this anymore. It's making me feel deeply uncomfortable and I'm not okay with it. And it's really nice actually to see that I think a lot more people are starting to speak up and realise they're not on their own. You know, it actually gives us all a lot of strength, I think, um, 
So thank you. Thank you so much for running your podcast and bringing this amazing community of people together because I'm sure everyone listening to this or watching this gets a lot out of it. I know I do. It's like it's fortifying in a way. Yeah, definitely, mate. It's it, I, I like having these conversations because it, 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 it like raises me up. And yeah. as I say, I understand there's other people doing other things because a lot of the time we work through a screen. So it's really yeah. uplifting to like spend nearly an hour with you. You know what I mean? And you've been so generous with your time. And uh, I just, all I can say is you've got allies in us and we've got a good community. And like some of the people in the in the um, live chat there, they're clinically extremely vulnerable people who need the NHS. And like, I can get out in the world again now and I'm not going to pull the trap door just because I've got better, you know? No. And I think that's, that's given me more heart. I mean, I was a community worker for 20 odd years, working with heart to like reach young people. They... Yeah none i don't think any of them could afford private health care strangely enough yeah. so i'm going yeah. to bat for them i'm going to bat for me i'm going to bat for my family i'm going to bat for you and anybody else who cares because if we lose this we're never getting it back exactly and, uh, exactly the politicians so not all of the politicians some of them are brilliant actually i don't want to i don't want to put every politician down yeah, because sure. some of them are doing a fantastic job fighting for the nhs right but a lot of the politicians are are pushing through these things, and unless we do something fast, it's gonna it's going to end. We're gonna lose it because there are important and rich people who have interests here, and they're the ones being listened to, not the public, and the public aren't being served by any of this. So anyway, if anybody would like to know more about that, the book comes out in two weeks' time. It's not yeah. a fat book. It's the kind of book that you could read quite quickly. <laughs> yeah. And if you if you want it, or you if you maybe you already understand all this stuff, but if you, for example, want to give it to someone who doesn't understand all this yet, sure. it's quite easy to read. So, um, thank you, and thank you so much for hosting me, Mike. I really, it's lovely to chat to you. Yeah, it's great, mate. And it, like for me, it's a bit of a completion cycle because, like, when we last spoke, I was really desperately ill and just trying everything to get my life back and. It's lovely that we can actually talk and this is going to go out and everything. So it's for me, it's like a bit of a marker in the sand, so to speak, that I've got more healthy, which is all yeah. for me, all the more reason to use some of this energy to do work like this. And so I really appreciate your time, mate. And don't be a stranger. Do get in touch. And um, if you, you need anything from us. Thank you. For you. Well, thanks, everyone. And I'm really sorry if I've depressed anyone this morning. No, mate. We, I, we depress people every day, so they're, they're used to it, but now you haven't. It's like information's power, as we say, and if we don't yeah. proliferate this stuff, like imagine like even one person's like, I didn't know that, you know? But there's people in the comments there that didn't know about Palantir, they didn't know about some of the things that you're saying, you yeah. know? And yeah. that is power. They can then take that other people, like verbally, like you say, pass the book on, that's the thing we can verbally speak this into existence and eventually we'll hit a critical mass where you know people need to be held to their pledges at the next election and maybe yeah. work leading into that as we are to so people can make an informed choice i'm not telling exactly. anybody who to vote for you do you yeah. but what i am yeah. saying is do it on the basis of what benefits the most people and as we yeah. say if we lose the nhs as a main pillar of uh, to me it's the only thing i can think of that i'm proud of about the country right now mm -hmm. you know people talk about being proud to be british i'm proud of the nhs mm -hmm. proud well of, a lot proud of people of... are there's been polls actually of kind of what makes you proud to be british and it comes out on top or close to the top and then you get these i mean i'm just ranting on now but um, you know, you get think tanks or people who are associated mm -hmm. with think tanks being allowed to write opinion pieces saying things like the NHS is rubbish and but needs to think, why on earth is the mainstream media profiling someone who works for a right wing think tank to say this sort of thing about the NHS? It's just absolute nonsense. You know, but yeah. as you said at the beginning of the podcast, Mike, some seeds of doubt are being planted, aren't they? And unfortunately because the nhs is collapsing and because a lot of people are getting a terrible service at the moment not due to the the staff the staff doing everything they can but i mean you know there's a lot of people getting poor care right now yeah. so people are looking for answers and if you open the papers and you see something that says it's crap we should replace it with a healthcare insurance system for some people they are looking for solutions and they take that seriously so we need to be pushing back against it like you say giving people the information they need which is factual <laughs> So. definitely i mean that's what it's about give people the evidence and people can yeah. do whatever they want with it i think that's yeah. just what we're trying yeah. to do i would never ever try and impose my will on anybody like uh, all i want to do is just say this is how it really is 
now yeah. you do whatever you want to do yeah. with that yeah yeah Mate, we're coming up in an Absolutely. hour here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go. But we're, I could honestly talk to you all day. Do you know what it is? I had twenty questions written down here, and you're so easy to talk. They were just sack them off and just had a conversation. Oh, well, it's really lovely to chat to you, Mike. I agree. It's it's lovely. You're great to talk to, and thanks so much to anyone who's listening or um, watching and and offering comments as well. Because um, all feedback, all discussion is is good, isn't it? It's beneficial. We all yeah. learn from each other. Definitely, ah. definitely. All right, thank um, you so much, Mike. There's some reactions outstanding. Sure, well done, all involved. I just want to point out, uh, Stephen. There, he's just got out of hospital. Um, NHS literally saved his life, and he was in the comments from the ward. Um, Stephen's a Gosh. care worker, and he worked through throughout all of the lockdowns. And we're trying to work out whether it's a COVID long COVID thing. Uh, he was in the long ward, oh. and then he was put in the heart ward. So he's out now, and he's. So big up Charla and everybody else in the comments. Yeah. I wish we had time for showing them the most, but outstanding seems to be the general consensus in the comments there. So big up everybody who's tuned in today and yourself, Jules. Like I say, anything you need, mate, just let me know. Anything coming up, come back on if you wish. Out you like, mate. We've, we've Thank got you. We've so got your back, guys. Thank you. All right, guys. More, go to everydoctor.org.uk. Cheers, mate. Speak to you soon, eh? Bye. Bye. See you later. That was Dr. Julia Grace Patterson there. Lovely person, great human being. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, we did speak during the time when I was ill and up and down, and it's just lush for me to be able to actually do this. As you can see on the screen, for and also for audio listeners, everydoctor.org.uk to find out more. Um, thanks so much for being in the, in the live chat. I was going to um, sort of bring a, a few of you in, but we got a bit emotional at the end and I didn't want to sort of like keep Jules long, long of that out, you know, um, and I was getting a bit emotional as well. Look, this means everything to me, everything. Um, the NHS, as I've said many times to people who've watched or listened for a long time, um, it saved my life. The, that conversation would not have happened without it and I will give my life to defend it. I'll see you later, everybody. Um, please share this with people and inform them what, what what's really going on. Catch you later, man. Probably tomorrow, Friday, if you're listening after the fact. So there'll be a show there if you're listening in the future. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.